Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, I'm Alexis Wagoner. For anyone who doesn't yet know me, I am the marketing and education director for Weststar. And this is, um, I think, the third now in this new kind of initiative that we're doing of what I'm calling scholar roundtables. So kind of picking a topic and then featuring a, a two or three different scholars to talk with us about, a, about that topic and do a little bit of Q&A as well. So today we're going to be talking about the clobber passages. And I guess I should probably start off for anyone that doesn't know, just um, say a few words about Weststar. Um, the way that we describe ourselves is that we bridge the gap we, between the scholarship of religion and between cultures. So to that end, we're made up of kind of a conglomeration of both scholars, people that study religious scholarship, and um, and lay folks who are just interested in how this affects us, um, what it has to say to our cultural moment, how we can put good theology and, and good biblical uh, interpretation into practice and those sorts of things. So certainly these roundtables are one of the ways that we are attempting to do that. And we have live events and events around the country as well and all kinds of other resources and things. So if you're not as familiar with Westar, um, I will send out more information after this call and obviously we'll be happy to answer any questions about that um, in general. But specifically tonight, we are talking about the clobber passages and we'll get a little bit more into what we mean by that. But before we do that, I wanted to let you guys know that in the chat box, if you um, know how to get to that in the Zoom settings on the bottom down there by, um, on the bottom of kind of the speaker screen, there's a little icon that says chat. And if you click that, that'll open up the chat window. And I've put a link to the passages to a, a document where you can that you can download that has the passages that Marty and Perry are going to be talking about tonight. So you can kind of follow along um, with the actual text. So we are joined by Marty Susi and Perry Key. And Marty has her PhD in Hebrew Bible from Vanderbilt and is a professor of biblical interpretation emerita at the Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis. Um, she says she's formally retired, but still teaching a few classes a year. And then Perry is uh, the chairperson of our board and the, an associate professor emeritus at the University of Indianapolis. So Perry's actually gonna, or sorry, Marty is actually gonna kick us off by explaining first a little bit more about what we mean when we say clobber passages, and then talk about this idea kind of from a, a bird's eye, higher level perspective before we get down into some of the more nitty gritty. So Marty, I will let you take it from here. Okay, the uh, phrase clobber passage comes from uh, GLBTQ folk who say they feel like they've been hit with a hammer when people trot out these passages. Um, they are uh, two passages pertaining to Sodom in Genesis 19 and uh, Jude. And then there are a pair of uh, prescriptions in Leviticus uh, from the priestly instructions saying that a man who lies with a man is with a woman. Uh, either shall be put to death or has at least committed an abomination. Uh, and then in the New Testament, there are two passages in uh, one in Corinthians and one in First Timothy that list off various kinds of sinners, including uh, terms that seem to refer to male homosexuality. And then in Romans, uh, very near the beginning, as Paul is setting up his argument, um, is a comment about women who are consumed with passion for one another and men who commit shameless acts with men. And by the way, um, the handout, I forgot to put the credit on it, is NRSV, except if there's an indication otherwise or something in brackets. Great. So that was the NRSV I was just quoting. Great. So can you give us a picture then of, like I said, before we kind of get into these specific passages of what we do with these texts as folks that are clearly, you know, I think hopefully most of us not interested in using them in the clobber way, um, but how we make sense of the fact that these exist in the biblical canon um, and what, what, if anything we do, or do we just say that's ancient history, we're in the 21st century, that's what, they thought, and it doesn't really affect us. Um, but for those of us trying to engage with folks that for whom those still hold sway, 
Um, what are some of your thoughts and ideas around how we might address what okay, these well, things say? Obviously, the list I just gave was pretty short. You could add David and Jonathan <laughs> and comments about a man being married to a woman. Um, because we only have an hour tonight, we didn't put those on the starting list. Uh, but even so, that's a, a dozen places in the Bible that even address the issue. Mm -hmm. Um, and because it's, it's totally natural for, um, those who, if, if the Bible is an authority for you and you're wrestling with an issue, you go see what the Bible has to say about that issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, as background, I think it's pretty important to notice that quite often we don't abide by what the Bible says <laughs> about an issue. Uh, first, because um, there's the idea that some things are ritual and some things are moral, and that moral teachings are binding, but ritual teachings are not. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we get the sense that um, so, so mixed fibers would be example of something mm. that Christians tend to take as a ritual teaching and don't find binding. Uh, we also, if we think the biblical writer is taking something that's actually just part of their human culture and presenting it as natural and as a divine law, we may decide not to pay attention. So for a long time uh, in our society, we expected, uh, accepted Paul's comments about long and short hair mm -hmm. being natural to mm -hmm. men and women. I think at this point, most people don't. Right. <laughs> um, so that's one where our understanding has shifted. Uh, and then um, Christians in particular love the stories in the New Testament where Jesus does, uh, declares that there are more important principles uh, of compassion or people being, well, he typically, when it's Jesus, there's something said about his having pity or having compassion. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we can kind of get that that might be a case where we want to set something aside. Um, it's an example, if you went and looked up what the Bible says about slavery, both Testaments pretty much are seven. And yet probably, it is very widely accepted that the idea that all humans are in the image of God would suggest that slavery is not a good idea, even not a godly idea, even if the Bible accepts it. So uh, with that in mind, um, I want to talk a little bit about the idea of what nature is. Mm. Um, in the Bible, mm -hmm. and a little bit of background since the question of marriage for gays and lesbians, mm -hmm. a hot one in our society, talk about what biblical marriage is about, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, do a little bit of a closing note on the diversity in the canon. Mm -hmm. So, ideas of nature, mm -hmm. uh, Levi Leviticus especially, mm -hmm. is, uh, by a priestly writer who is fascinated by the idea that God has made a creation that is diverse and flourishing, fertile. There are creatures that can make more like themselves uh, and that it started out as a model, but now it's separated out into all these kinds of things and species. Yeah. Um, but sometimes that writer gets a little carried away with trying to get things into clean boxes. Yeah. So, uh, most animals that chew cud have split hooves. And most animals that have single hooves, like horses and donkeys, don't chew cud. Mm. Pigs have split hooves, but don't chew cud. Therefore, pigs <laughs> are unnatural. Mm. Uh, in the priestly writer's thinking, and, and this is why they're unclean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's not something we take in, even if we might be sympathetic with the general idea of staying in line with what's natural. Right. Uh, for that writer, it's also natural that uh, male has precedent over female and older generations over younger generations. Mm -hmm. And that comes out in the section in Leviticus uh, 18, where there's a whole list of forbidden sexual relationships uh, I didn't give you the passage I'm going to refer to now on the handout, but uh, in, in the immediately adjacent text, there's a whole list of who you can't uncover the nakedness of. Right, right. 
And, and we should keep in mind here, the conception is apparently that the act of intercourse is a dominance act. Mm. So there's a superior and an inferior in that process. Interestingly, this list does not directly forbid a father having intercourse with his daughter. Oh. Now, this is not to say that they thought that was a good thing. Right. That's not what I'm saying. But it doesn't violate either the superiority of the older over the younger or the male over the female. Mm -hmm. What it does forbid, what it does forbid is having a sex with both a woman and her daughter, which mm -hmm. would stop you from having sex with your own daughter. Mm, right. <laughs> um, but see that if the same man is having sex with both of them, that puts them on an equal footing. Mm. But they shouldn't be because one is an older generation and one is a younger generation. So it's uh, in professional ethics, you know, they call this role conflict. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, there, there, there's a ethic, not explicitly stated, but you can see it at work in this passage about not messing up those relationships. Moving on to marriage, um, I did give you a section from Deuteronomy 22. Uh, and uh, there are two things here. One is about a man who marries a virgin and decides he doesn't like her and accuses her of not being a virgin. According to Deuteronomy, this is a capital offense. Now, there's a problem about whether biblical laws were actually expected to be enacted or whether it's a form of utopian writing. Mm. Um, so we don't know if they actually did that. Okay. It, you don't see it actually happening until you get to the New Testament when they were trying to live by this okay. law. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, he ha he's tried to kill her with his false accusation. She's gonna be taken out and stoned. If her parents can prove that he's wrong, they got the bloody sheets, mm -hmm. he makes a payment to her father because marriage is a family business and the father's honor has been besmirched. Mm -hmm. And then he is not allowed to divorce her for the rest of her life. Mm -hmm. Now, there are people who feel more comfortable with divorce and people who feel less comfortable but if you were ever going to allow it, somebody who's already tried once to kill yeah. his wife <laughs> might be the one that you would say shouldn't divorce. And yet here, where divorce in general is available, it's a case where you can't have it. And yeah. that tells us that marriage is about something different in that world. Mm -hmm. uh, and what it is about is um, food, shelter, employment, protection, nursing if you're sick, and your only retirement plan are all coming from the family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't just go out and get a job, you know, right. and you don't have social security and you don't have a pension. It's all in the family. And unlike our society, the man and his wife are not going off as a nuclear family by themselves in an apartment. Mm -hmm they're living with a whole bunch of other people around. So her risk is different. And each of them has other people who can be intimate friends and companions. It's not, we, for us, marriage is about love and the spouse is gonna be your primary relationship in most people's minds. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the main thing that marriage was for mm -hmm. in the ancient world. Um, and it also is arranged by the parents. Uh, and clearly, family alliances are a big consideration in that. Yeah. The other big consideration is having children. Right. Remember, they're the only retirement plan. Mm -hmm. And remember, employment is the family business, and it needs able hands to carry it on. Yeah. There's very little interest in <laughs> things that would not um, lead to children. It, it, um, okay. Everything I was going to say. <laughs> okay. It's it's worth noticing uh, in this chapter from Deuteronomy 22, and um, following the case that I just talked about is if a man catches a woman and rapes her. 
it's clearly indicated this is wrong, he should be punished. I left out the part where he makes a payment to the father, but he does. Mm -hmm. And again, he can't divorce her. Mm -hmm because he's already wronged her and to make it up, he needs to provide her a secure living. That's what marriage is about in that world. Mm -hmm. But the chapter starts out with, you shall not wear clothes made of wool, or the section starts out, you shall not wear clothes made of wool and linen together. Mm -hmm. You shall not uh, make tassels on the four corners of the cloak with which you cover yourself. So they're not making any distinction between ritual and moral here. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the beginning of the chapter is no one whose uh, testicles are crushed or penis is cut off shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. No Ammonite or Moabite shall enter the assembly of the Lord to the fourth generation. Uh, you know, those are things we would be perfectly happy passing on. Um, I want to say that when you look up the rules on something, you, you, on almost every issue where you have both sides, you find something different if you go to the poetry and the stories than you do in the rules. The rules are an idea about, well, if everybody did it this way, wouldn't it work great? Mm -hmm. And as I said, it might be a form of utopian writing rather than, mm -hmm. I don't know that even the writer of Deuteronomy actually thought everybody was gonna do this. I don't know that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you go to Isaiah 56, Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right. Do not let the foreigner join to the Lord, say the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And do not let the eunuch say I am just a dry tree. Uh, for thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. Yeah. Uh, and then the next verse is about the foreigners of the Lord, mm -hmm. foreigners having a place in the house of the Lord. This is just different than what Deuteronomy says, mm -hmm. where both of those groups are excluded. Mm -hmm. Isaiah is including them both. Uh, this is the passage that ends in verse 7 with, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Wow. For all. Mm -hmm. As Christians, we love this passage, and yet we feel free to ignore the fact that for both the... Um, eunuchs and the foreigners, the one specific thing it says they need to do is be keeping the Sabbath. Yeah. <laughs> so. A lot of picking and choosing. <laughs> thinking about how we decide what we adhere to and what we don't, because it's not true that we just do what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. My mm -hmm. sense is that, and the long hair would be a good example, when it fits with our cultural customs, we call it moral. Mm. And if it feels strange to us, we call it ritual. And in our society right now, we're caught in a case where some kinds of sexual relationships do feel culturally forbidden <laughs> to some people and to other people, they do not. And so you get a real disjuncture then on what you do with your living. Yeah, it's a really helpful, it's a really helpful background, um, especially as, someone that you know, knows the clobber passages, but um, to hear it kind of put in that larger context, I think is really helpful for folks. So we will definitely, I'm sure, talk more about that. But um, Perry, I wanna to turn to you for a little bit about Paul, who is also, unfortunately, very well used when we come to think of the clobber passages. Um, and to ask, as we get a little bit more into the nuance of the actual passages, like what kind of same gender sexual behavior would Paul have actually probably known about that he is then seems to be speaking out against in these passages and how can we again make sense of where that all falls? Oh, hang on, I'm trying to unmute you. <laughs> there you go. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> sorry, no, my bad. Uh, just want to uh, uh, first thank Marty for uh, joining me tonight or joining us tonight. Uh, uh, it's great to work with her and a word of greeting to all the people that uh, are on uh, live tonight and um, those who might uh, be watching the recording later on. Um, so can you repeat the last part of your question there? I'm yeah, sorry. yeah. Um, just leading into talking about Paul and he's known for obviously speaking out against same-sex behavior and a few famous passages. So what kind of same gender behavior or same, yeah, same gender sexual behavior 
would he have even been exposed to? Would have he have even known about in that time? Um, and how can we use that to help us maybe make better sense of some of the stuff that he is saying? Okay, thanks. Um, one of the one of the challenges that all of us have reading the Bible or any ancient text is uh, trying to hear the the words, trying to follow the the case or the argument or the story. Uh, in terms that uh, made sense in the culture of that time. Um, we might see the words on the page and think it makes perfectly good, clear sense to us, but we're hearing it with a different uh, frame of reference, a different set of cultural ears and eyes, uh, as it were. Uh, so one of the things that when you, when you ask about these same gender behaviors, uh, for example, in Paul, what would Paul have known? Now, certainly Paul would have known the Levitical text that Marty referenced. That's part of his background. Mm -hmm. um, but what's, you know, if you were walking in, you know, through one of the streets of uh, the Hellenistic world, what would he perhaps have some experience with? And while there's a variety of things, two, two come to mind pretty uh, seriously. One is the practice of pederasty. Um, pederasty in the ancient world uh, uh, wasn't practiced everywhere, but it was practiced in certain parts of Greece. It was uh, practiced to some degree in Rome. Uh, but this was... Uh, Again, there, there are all kinds of nuances here that I don't have time to go into, but these were relationships between adult men and uh, boys, young men who were quite males yet. You know, the, the, um, the, the saying was that uh, uh, they're, they're not yet begun to show a beard or just beginning to grow facial hair. What's odd about this to us is that at least at its beginnings in uh, archaic and classical Rome, uh, excuse me, Greece, this was a consensual relationship between the adult male and the young man's father. Mm. So it kind of goes back to some of these um, status uh, attaining moves uh, between families. What, what, we, what we know is that these adult males, if they weren't already married, would go on and get married and raise families. And the young males who were a part of these sexual relationships would eventually uh, uh, get married and were expected mm -hmm. to have children. That doesn't quite compute with, you know, modern notions of same gender male relationships. Right. Um, there were critics, uh, not just in the Jewish and early Christian world, but there were occasionally Greek and, and uh, Roman moralists who worried that there was an improper power relationship in some of these. So you do find that sometimes. Um, in, in the Roman world, and Marty alluded the, to this a bit, uh, males, especially um, free adult males, were uh, okay to have sex with whomever so long as they were the dominant partner and so long as they weren't doing it with another man's wife. You know, that, that went on, but that was not looked upon fondly. Right. Um, because there was this assumption that uh, a free adult male is the active member, the penetrator. Hmm. Uh, women, by definition, were the passive recipient. Now, that's a long way of getting into um, some of what's going on there in Romans 1, uh, which, by the way, is the only passage in the Old or New Testament which has anything to say about female-on-female -female sexual relations. So I want to get into Romans 1 a little bit, although it's an extraordinarily uh, complex uh, text, so I'm just going to kind of take the overview. Mm -hmm. but, but we always have to start with the immediate literary context, and Paul's making a kind of argument here. He's leading up to something, and 
the behaviors that Paul lists as uh, improper are regarded by Paul as the consequences of idolatry. Mm. So everything that he lists there, not just the same gender behaviors, but he's got a long list of, of uh, evil things, you know, um, that, that uh, include a bunch of things not even sexually related. All of that he regards as the products of or the, the consequences of idolatry. So right there, you, you, you need to be attentive to, to where that argument's taking you. You know, in a 21st century setting, we know lots of uh, uh, gay and lesbian uh, and, and queer people who, many of whom are practitioners of a religious faith, many are not. It'd be a little hard to make the argument that they are who they are because they started out as idolaters. <laughs> Right? I mean, mm -hmm. it, it seems like a kind of almost flippant thing to say, and yet I don't mean for it to be flippant. It's, it doesn't fit the, the, the literary context Paul, Paul is making. Mm -hmm. So what kind of, uh, what is it about uh, female uh, same gender relations that bothers Paul? I think it's this notion that he shared with his culture that females are the passive partners mm -hmm. and who's the dominant partner in this it's, mm -hmm. it just doesn't compute in his mind i think he's a he is in at that point a product of his time mm -hmm. uh the same gender uh uh relationship relating to males i've already pointed out that he would probably have thought first of pederastic relationships but we can't forget that in the ancient world, prostitution was very common. It was very open. It was, uh, at least in the Roman world, highly regulated because it can be taxed. Uh, there's an idea for you. Um, uh, but uh, we tend to forget that a great number of the people who were prostitutes in the ancient world were slaves. Yeah. Not all of them were, but many were. And so uh, these were not people, sometimes the, the victims were, were simply having their bodies sold by others mm -hmm. or, you know, to satisfy the pleasures of, of others. Mm -hmm. So when, when we look at those kinds of, uh, that kind of cultural background and ask, does any of this really map onto what we see today Yes, there are still uh, people in our world who are the victims of a sex slave industry. Uh, n no doubt about that. And, and we would condemn that. Paul would condemn that. Mm -hmm. But would Paul, would Paul know anything about uh, committed, consensual relationships between adult females or adult males, etc.? I don't think that computes with him. I, I, it's just not part of what he would have understood to be culturally visible. Yeah. Yeah. So it's an apples to oranges kind of comparison. Yeah. To so, take him to read him onto our context today. Yeah. Yeah. So so that's just the the very short uh, uh, initial take there on Romans one. Paul mentions a a, a couple of other uh, a couple of other short text and and i'm going to refer back to uh marty's document that she put out first corinthians 6. again it's a little bit of a a laundry list of, of evil uh actions or uh, people who do bad things and this is where translation can be uh tricky so this is again the, the new revised standard version uh first corinthians 6. don't you know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of god don't be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, sodomites, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, robbers, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Now these two words, uh, three words really, male prostitutes and sodomites, uh, I, I think most of us today would realize uh, those are not particularly good translations. The, and, and Marty helpfully put in the Greek for those uh, on her, her handout. 
the word, the two words translated uh, male prostitutes it is one word in Greek, malakoi, and it just means soft ones, mm -hmm. soft persons, if you wish. The other one translated sodomites is arsenokoitai, plural for ar arsenokoites. And this is an odd word. I say odd because everyone who first encountered it in the ancient world commented on what an unusual word. Um, it, it, etymology helps a little bit. It's uh, based on a word meaning male and a verb meaning to lie. So that seems straightforward enough, but we know enough about etymologies across the board to know that it's never, it's not always straightforward. Like think of our word chairman, right? <laughs> you know, it, that's, that's uh, it, it, broken down literally, etym etymology doesn't help you a, a whole lot with that. Right. <laughs> um, the, the, the kind of typical or standard understanding here is that the mollicos, the soft one, is, is maybe the, the, um, the passive, uh, the young male, and the arsenicoites might be uh, the, the dominant one. Paul might have the Levitical passages in mind mm -hmm. there for this, what may have been a term he coined, though we can't be sure. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not obvious that, that this describes anything that we would recognize by consenting people, you know, adult people in the 20th century or 21st century. Now, First Timothy, picks up on this, and this is the passage also on uh, uh, Marty's list. I'm just going to read a part of it. It too has a, uh, a list of bad behaviors, and verse 10 includes fornicators, sodomites, again, arsenokoites, and slave traders. Mm. Now, that, that's kind of interesting to me because if you take Mal uh, uh, Malakos, uh, arsenicoites, and then this word for slave trader, you, you could understand that as a reference to the sex slave who's hired out by the slave trader to some sort of aggressive male who mm. wants to have his way with uh, a victim that can't refuse. Mm -hmm. And we can't be 100% certain, but it, it certainly looks to me more like some sort of situation of unequal power and abuse rather than uh, a situation where consenting adults uh, uh, lovingly are sharing each other. That, there's nothing 100% guaranteed about this, but it, it, it comes back to the, the question or the issue that the biblical texts come out of very different times and places. And there is, unfortunately for us, a disjunction between their world and ours. And I'll make the point again, just mapping our world onto the world of the text mm -hmm. doesn't work if you're trying to be honest with where the texts are coming from. Yeah. Wow, so much stuff. Um, thanks to you both for the kind of, I know it's an overview, but still there's a lot there. So for the overview and um, conversation, and now I would like to open up, I'm gonna like open up my gallery view here so I can see folks. So if you have a question, um, if you wanna physically raise your hand, there's also like a little uh, way to do that with Zoom where you can do like a little hand raise and it'll show up for me. So um, if folks have questions or you can type them in uh, to the chat here, which I see, okay, I see someone did that. So I will go ahead and read that one to kick us off. So Donna asks, Interested to know what you would say about the word fornicators. Any thoughts on the word fornicators? Um, in, in the Greek, it, it's, uh, it originally referred to uh, someone who uh, commits um, the sexual act with another person outside of marriage. Uh, it tends to become, at least uh, in, in Greek, uh, a sort of generalized term for sexual improprieties, though chief among them would be adultery or sex uh, uh, outside of marriage. 
but it sometimes you know can take on more metaphorical meanings. M Marty might have some something to say from the Hebrew Bible, but I think she's muted here. I think she doesn't want to say anything. Okay. Okay. I think I think if you mute your because I didn't Marty I didn't mute you so I think if you muted yourself you can unmute yourself just FYI I think. There we go. Um, okay, there you go. So did you have anything you wanted to add or no? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. So any other any other thoughts and questions? We have other things we can discuss. So I don't want to, but I don't want to cut anybody off from the opportunity to weigh in with their own predicaments, so to speak. I I just there's one general thing that I neglected to say, sure. which is that. Um, in Christianity, as it eventually unfolded, sex is any kind of sex sort of is what we think of when we hear the word sin. Mm -hmm. So if Jesus has an encounter with a woman who is a sinner, mm -hmm. we'll jump to the conclusion that her sin must have been sexual. Um, that's absolutely not true in the Hebrew Bible, mm -hmm. where sex is by and large look, looked on as a delight and a right and proper thing. And the situation starts to get more complicated um, in the New Testament, partly because there's more of a dualism coming in via the culture and also because of the apocalyptic expectation that time was short and you didn't need a retirement plan. <laughs> True. But, but that, that's just worth saying is that for us, the whole subject is surrounded by a, even if we're kicking against it, there's, there's a long history of, of sex being seen as mm -hmm. a problem. We talked a little bit about how oppressive um, marriage could be in terms of not choosing your own spouse and going with it. This is why not, not because sex is evil, but this is one of the things that that the teaching that it's okay for a widow to stay a widow or a virgin to stay a virgin mm -hmm. uh, in the New Testament mm -hmm. opening up, and it's why it was received not as oppression but as good news. Yeah, you have to marry who Daddy says. Yeah. So I've got a couple of questions that have come in on chat. Um, let's see. The first one is from Catherine, and this was this is an interesting one because I liked how you how you talked about this, but I'd love to hear you say more, Marty. She asks, "Can you talk more about utopian writing?" Oh, um, law in the ancient world in general uh, was more like what we think of as arbitration than what we yeah. think of as regular court practice. We have the idea of a written code and very standardized rules where the judge's job is to see that the letter of the code is applied. And, and we ameliorate that with the jury system that if there's a real problem with the law, one hopes the jury kicks and won't, <laughs> won't convict. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, in the ancient world, it was more going to a council of elders mm -hmm. who knew the parties. And what they were trying to do was not apply an abstract standard of blind justice, but figure out, figure out a solution that would set things right and keep peace in the village. And as you get into the monarchy in the Hebrew Bible, there's the idea that you can bring a case for personal appeal to the king. And it's the same kind of idea that sort of this is the ultimate elder um, who will figure out something that's right. So the woman comes to David saying, I have two sons and one gets Actually, she's reflecting to David his own family situation, but she said, you know, I have two sons and one son killed the other son, so I've already lost one of them. And if we apply the standard penalty, then I'm not going to have any sons. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a case where avenging the murder by, kill, by the death penalty really it doesn't help. Mm -hmm. Nobody agrees with her. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so that's how at least in the world of the Hebrew Bible, uh, what you call ju justice, you know, the words that we translate in that family are working. It's more of a model of 
the elders hearing and the other elders at the gate bearing witness to what's going on. Mm -hmm. So then when you do get these written law codes, it's not clear that, and the ones in Israel are very parallel to the ones in Egypt uh, and the ones in Mesopotamia. The big, uh, some of the rules are exactly the same. The big exception is um, it's quite common in the ancient Near East for a law to be phrased in terms of if a man of high status does this to a man of X other status, here's the penalty, but if he does it to so it's sort of penalties are graded by social ranks and that mm. less true in the Hebrew codes. In other ways, they might seem not quite as enlightened mm. as the Mesopotamian ones do. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but so it's not quite clear, you know, who's generating the codes and what their status is. And if you think about things like the Jubilee Law, there is, there's a fair bit, some of the stuff in the codes is common sense. Sure. If you borrow your neighbor's ox and it dies while you're borrowing it, you split the cost mm -hmm. <laughs> of the loss. Uh, if you don't put a fence around your roof and somebody falls off and gets injured, you're liable. Mm -hmm. and, you know, um, but then there's stuff like the legislation of all land going back to its original owners and all debts being right. killed and all slaves being set free every 50 years. There's no evidence that they were doing that during the time mm -hmm. of the monarchy. They did try it after they came back from exile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, when, and, and we can absolutely identify with the ideal that's being expressed there, that right. they will not keep getting richer, that there will be some way of maintaining an evenness in society and for people who've gotten into a hole to be able to get back out of it. And yet when you actually try and practice something like that, it turns out people are very clever at finding ways around sure. something like that. It, it didn't play out as well when they actually tried to do it yeah. as, it, as an idea. That, that would be an example. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's up for debate right now, but it has, it's an idea I ran across years ago and I tucked it in the back of my head and the more I think about it, the more sense it makes out of what's in those codes. Yeah, yeah. that is interesting. Um, so, Timothy, going, sticking kind of with Hebrew Bible, but going in a little bit different direction, asks, so what about the role or significance of Sodom and Gomorrah? And then also a question about the meaning or the purpose of the word abomination in those in Levitical passages. Okay. Um, abomination is a word for something that incites disgust because it's so far out of line with how things ought to be. Um, as we think about that feeling of disgust, I always ask my classes to think about snot. <laughs> That's how kind of we feel. <laughs> in, you know, we cringe as well. yeah. Yeah. And you could even run an evolutionary argument, you know, that this is inbred into it because it feels like it's inbred into us. But if you've ever had a two-year-old with a cold, they're digging it out of their nose and eating it. It's not inbred at all. We learn the feeling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So, so, you know, eating pigs, people were willing to die mm -hmm. during the Maccabean Rebellion rather than eat pig because you know, it was a line drawn in the sand about what God had said and and yet we don't the Christians generally don't see it that way and there are even wings of Judaism that don't see it that way mm -hmm. um, Sodom um, I mentioned sex as an act of power mm -hmm. that is known in today's world too uh, for instance there are gangs where a transgressor will be disciplined by being raped by the somebody senior in the gang and and the idea is you are so puny i can treat and i am so manly that i can stand to you as a man normally does to a woman and it doesn't it's not a bit to say that the person doing the rape is homosexual it's almost the opposite 
it, it, it's, it's an act of macho dominance. Uh, it, it comes up in war a lot as well. It's not that the soldiers are gay. Right. It, it's a power thing. That looks like what's going on in Sodom. I, I think they are clearly proposing to rape the visitors. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't conclude from that that they were all homosexual in their orientation and only interested in men because some of them are engaged to Lot's daughters. And there is a population in the city which has been propagating. Yeah. Uh, so there is a case of gang rape. Mm. And I don't know that you can conclude anything from gang rape. Yeah. Yeah, of course, that's regarded as negative. Marty. I'm sorry, yeah. Is it, um, you alluded to this, but one of the really important elements of that story is that Lot himself, as well as the angels who come to visit, they're outsiders. They're literally foreigners. Yes. Yes. And we've got a parallel story in Judges 19. You might have been coming to that. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. none of the characters there have, have first names. <laughs> but right. you've but you've got but there the woman a woman is thrown out at, lot proposes throwing his daughters into the street and the angels intervene in the other story in judges a woman is thrown in the street mm -hmm. so they rape her all night instead yeah and she's also a visitor yeah so so the, you know we we wouldn't you know it's an awful story it's a morally outrageous story yeah and the bible's not condoning what was done to the woman right we would not conclude from that that oh well heterosexuality is a sin because look what they did to that point. <laughs> exactly it's like, yeah. Yeah. by the way the same custom is probably alluded to uh in the story of saul's death on the battlefield his sons are dead he's cut off most of the army is wiped out the philistines are coming and he says to his armor bearer, kill me lest the Philistines make sport with me. Make sport is what when Abimelech looks out the window, if he sees Isaac doing with his wife and realizes that she must be his wife. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, let's see. I'm gonna read out in case anybody didn't see it. So Ellie is one of our scholars and she joined, um, and she just left a little comment here because she's also done a lot of work on this sort of household code sort of stuff. Um, and she said, just a note on the existence of same-sex mutual relationships, I think of a number of inscriptions that indicate the existence of such relationships. One indicates a relationship between a gallus, which is a self-castrated servant of the mother of the gods, and a soldier. The vocabulary is interesting because it indicates a spousal relationship. Um, it does not use the vocabulary period that specifically you were talking about. So it is hard to argue that Paul addresses same-sex spousal relationships, but just kind of bringing in the idea that there might have been um, other examples that other than others of the ones that you were talking about, Perry, um, as being kind yeah. of um, I, not apples to apples. I, I really appreciate uh, Ellie's uh, uh, text there because we're, we're just kind of flying over. Yes the text and there's there's so much work that's been done in the last 20 odd years uh, and a lot of the information a lot of the evidence is scattered you know like she yeah. refers to an inscription or several inscriptions those aren't yeah. easily accessible um, I'm doing a program here real soon uh, Jesus Sermon on the Road with Ali Katouche mm -hmm. and Ali's got some magnificent uh, oh, yeah. pictures yeah. Uh, of of some potential uh, uh, same gender uh, relationships uh, in the early Christian tradition. Uh, it's yeah. it it's stunning to think about. So yeah, there's so much more out there that uh, just begs for greater yeah. greater investigation. Yes, and there I will. That's one of the, one of the events that we do. You're talking about Perry. Well, plug that and I can I'll put a link to the follow-up email that I send um, to all you that joined and everyone that signed up but the if anyone is in or around the Boulder area of Colorado 
um, Perry and one of our other scholars, Allie, who also does a lot of really, really fascinating work on this. Um, they'll be there in two weeks, I believe, roughly. So that would be a great thing to catch if you can. And Ellie also, and I'll link to this also in the email that I send, but Ellie um, has a presentation or a video that addresses some of the stuff that she's talking about, as well as a, as a whole book, which you also have, Perry. But um, yeah, so um, sidebar there a little bit, and I can link to some of those resources for sure. But want to get to Donna's question, which will probably bring us to about wrapping up. So she says, so here's this, I love ending on a boots on the ground kind of question. So for a congregation discerning, becoming ONA, open and affirming, are there passages that you would recommend that speak back to these clobber passages um, that can maybe answer back to some of these? To put you on the spot. Biblical passages that are different that take us in a different direction? Is that the question? I think I, that would be my guess. Um, Donna, if you want to clarify in the messaging, you can. But my, my assumption there would be like, um, that would kind of answer back to if someone throws up this, oh, well, Paul says yada yada, or what about Sodom and Gomorrah? In addition to, you know, as you've explained it, just being able to articulate, well, it's not what you maybe think it is. Um, maybe what are some other examples of texts that could be used to help folks see a different perspective. I think maybe Marty, you were getting at it a little bit when you said there's, you know, a lot of what you see in the law texts is not what you see in the story, the poetry, the way that these this stuff is actually playing out. So maybe pointing to some of some of those examples perhaps. And that is true. The trouble is if you're looking for things specifically relating to homosexuality, they're really right. I should say something about David and Jonathan. Yes, I love you too. Say is that it's like a movie where two people are standing gazing into each other's eyes in front of the bedroom door and they start to reach towards each other and the screen fades out and then you see them having breakfast. <laughs> you can't prove that they had sex. Probably that's the implication. You can't prove that David and Jonathan are in a homosexual relationship. I think that it's pretty strongly implied. Um, that's more probable to me because David has spent so much time with the Philistines mm. who are loosely speaking a Greek related culture. They're coming, they're not part of the Semitic right. world. Uh, David has, David has been living with them and there's a lot about the story like the, you know, single combat between the armies that's supposed to settle everything. Uh, that is reminiscent of Greek hero tales. In the Greek hero tale, the, the young warrior lord always has his shield mate, mm. who's a lover. The mm. problem with that one, and I wish this worked so, but I will be honest about what I think, all of David's relationships are exploitive. Mm. His relationships with women are all exploitive, and I think the relationship with Jonathan while not presented as a terrible thing, it's presented as a positive light, in a positive light, I think. But what's happening is it's being used to say, and see even Saul's heir is a subordinate to David and loves David and, mm -hmm. huh. and deliver all his stuff to David. Right, uh, right. So in that sense, it's, it, it's sort of going back to what Perry said, this is not a egalitarian relationship between peers. And there's enough anxiety in it that Jonathan feels feels it necessary to make David swear that David will do right by Jonathan. And neither one of them, both of them, of course, have wives and children. Right, right. Yes, that's an interesting, yeah, interesting. Because you hear that is bandied about in you know, kind of recent so scholarship, it, but I haven't heard that specific idea I of think it taking is, it. And it's yeah. not presented as an abomination. Right, right. But on the other hand, it's not a model marriage either. Right, true. So before we close, I do want to give you guys a chance to plug the mini seminar that you're going to be leading if you wanted to say a couple words. So to kind of just give a little bit of an explanation of that for folks. So we do academic focused seminars that are scholarship in public for the public. Um, so that was kind of how, how Westar started with Jesus, the Jesus seminar being the first one of these where a whole bunch of scholars got together and, and talked about the historical Jesus and, and discussed a whole bunch of things over many years. And um, so we've got several that, that are going now on different topics. Um, but 
we're introducing this new idea of mini seminars being something that would only take maybe a, you know a couple sessions or a year or two kind of to discuss a set of topics and so marty and perry you both are going to lead one upcoming next year on i think if i'm not mistaken the clobber passages so if you guys wanted to say anything about that i'd love to plug that for folks as well well, I, I guess I should start by saying that uh, the board has to approve it first. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> but kind of I, preview. I, <laughs> now they have to because I said it. <laughs> board meeting this week. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, conversations that I had with our executive director, David Galston, just indicated this was a good time to, to take this on. And I'm, I'm uh, grateful and delighted that uh, Marty agreed to. Uh, uh, sign on for this. So one of the things that what we're hoping to do is address all of these clobber passages. We didn't get to talk about all of them in in more uh, detail and with more care. We still will need to recruit a number of people to uh, be participants and writers and responders. Uh, so I, I, I can't say more until we, <laughs> we start doing that. But it's our hope that um, we can address this at our March meeting in Santa Rosa. And from the papers very fairly quickly uh, have some sort of uh, resource book available for yeah. our public trying to complete the circle, you know, uh, yeah. doing good scholarship uh, and communicating that with our public. Yeah, thanks Barry. And in the meantime, like I said, when I send out the follow-up email for the replay and everything for everybody. Um, we do have some links and commentary already on our website and links to other organizations that are doing good work in this area as well. So I'll be sure and send those out. And then um, usually what I've been trying to do is each roughly each month pick a pick like a theme like I said and then do one of these sort of round table talks, but then also have members only talks that we do in a more kind of intimate setting where you can actually kind of dialogue with scholars and stuff like that. So I'm working on planning a couple of those for this right, related to this topic. So I'm, I'm hoping to also have, as you were talking, Perry, um, have Ali talk about some of her work with gender in the early church and maybe even as Elliot, Ellie commented um, about her work, reminded me that she'd be another great person to have talk to us. So um, if you're not a member, we would love to have you and I will send a link to that as well in the follow-up email. So any closing thoughts or ideas from either of you, Perry or Marty? Marty, you go first. Thank you all. Thanks, Marty. Yeah. I'll thank everyone as well who uh, joined us tonight or will be watching this uh, in its recorded version. Uh, I'll put in the shameless plug if you're a member uh, Westar, thank you. Uh, if you've enjoyed what we've done tonight, I hope you'll consider joining because without your support, we can't do this kind of work. Well said, Perry. Well, thanks to you both again. Thank you everybody for showing up and for anyone who ends up listening later. We really appreciate and um, happy to hear any other ideas that you all have for upcoming topics that you'd like us to cover, work that we've done or scholars that you know of that have done interesting things that you'd like to hear more on. Um, I have to fill a lot of months of these. So I'd be happy for any suggestions that you have. So until the next one, I will see you guys later. Have a good one. Bye everybody. Thank yep, thanks guys. Thank